this uh, mountain bluebird. Hold on one second. Like this mountain bluebird that showed up uh, sort of just west of the Apopka area during the North Shore Festival a few years ago, or this Hammond's flycatcher from the West Coast that was down in Big Cypress. And then there are rare birds like this vermilion flycatcher, uh, which are becoming sort of regular annual winter visitors to Florida. And Florida is also well known for Caribbean strays like Zenata dove and banana quit, Western Spindalis. And one of the Florida's rarest birds recently was this gray tailed tattler on the right, uh, which was found down in the Florida Keys uh, with the kind of the miniature version of itself spotted sandpiper. And this was only the second or third record for the whole eastern half of the United States. So birds like that bring dozens to hundreds or thousands of birders. Here's a pretty typical scene in the UK where a ton of birders live on a relatively small island. So they all show up when a rare bird turns up. I'm sure you've seen scenes similar to this occasionally if you chase rare birds. Here's a whole bunch of us at the biggest week in American birding about 10 years ago when a Kirtland's warbler was found on the beach and we all rushed there. And more recently, back in November, uh, I was leading one of my South Texas tours and a social flycatcher was found, this bird, uh, which was the third record for the United States, really the first chaseable record. So a ton of people showed up. So what are rare birds? Basically, you can break them down into these three categories here, local rarities, which uh, a bronze cowbird there in the top right is a good example. They uh, are residents in South Florida, but when one turns up around Orlando or Lake Apopka, that's pretty notable locally. Then you have seasonal rarities, like the bottom left corner shows a white-faced ibis. Glossy ibis are year-round residents in Florida, but in the winter months, there's an increase in glossy ibis, and with them come a few rare white-faced ibis. And that's become kind of expected at Lake Apopka and other places. And then in the bottom right, true vagrants like this broad-billed hummingbird, excuse me, they should only be in Southeast Arizona or Central Mexico. So when this one turned up in Brevard or Volusia County, I forget, that's a really big deal, true rare vagrant. So birds turning up where they shouldn't be all comes back to migration. So let's briefly give a little migration overview here. Basically, birds are these incredible little computers and they have built-in clocks and compasses and they can naturally sense two coordinates, basically their position on earth and um, where they want to be, which is uh, sort of ingrained in, in their biology. And they use visual cues such as uh, the landscape and coastlines and mountain ranges or visual cues from other birds uh, to move and gather up. And they can also use celestial navigation, which is using the sun, moon, stars. Um, one second. To, to navigate at night. And to a lesser extent, or an unknown extent, I should say, is geomagnetic navigation. And so a few other factors related to migration are weather. Birds can use barometric pressure. For instance, the Viri shown here, they're well known for being able to detect uh, low and high pressure systems and know when to migrate from the East Coast down across the Atlantic Ocean to Brazil or not based on if they can detect uh, uh, changes in the barometric pe pressure and, and if they can, uh, they've been shown to be almost as efficient as our models in predicting uh, a hurricane or tropical storm off the Atlantic coast and they'll delay their migration or speed up their migration to avoid it. Uh, birds also use, uh, can see in polarized light 
and it's possible that they use ultrasound and smell as navigational cues. Uh, seabirds definitely use smell. So what what's uh, what are these birds capable of? Uh, models have shown that smaller birds, given good weather and a full fat load, are able to fly almost 2,000 miles, 1,850 miles nonstop. And a large bird like a shorebird can potentially travel 3,700 miles nonstop. So birds have incredible ability to travel if they want to. And certain species like these two shown here, the black pole warbler is the longest distance uh, migrant warbler in the world. And every year they migrate about 6,000 miles one way from Canada to the Amazon and back. And Bartel Godwitz, one of the longest distance migrants on earth, uh, does a 6,500 mile nonstop flight from New Zealand back up across the Pacific Ocean to Alaska, which is just crazy. And so th these, these mileages rival or, or better what we can do in airplanes. Then what's the detectability of rare birds? Obviously, uh, bad weather or good weather can affect our ability to find rare birds. The habitat you're looking in, a dense forest is harder to find things in the open grassland. Then the species involved, like this very small camouflage Harris sparrow is a lot harder to find than a five foot tall flamingo. And our coverage, basically, you have places like Merritt Island or Lake Apopka that are birded by dozens of birders every day. And so the rare birds are found there uh, versus some little woodlot that only gets visited once a year. So there's been some research into this. And in the UK, uh, it was determined that even with very intensive coverage by thousands of birders in the UK, only about 60% of rare birds, uh, well, I should say, 60% of rare birds go undetected. And so that shows that simply most birds avoid us or we don't notice them. So how many birds are slipping by us right now? And um, a common one that may do this all the time is cave swallow here. Uh, it's just a small swallow probably flying high overhead and could easily fly right by you and you'd never look up to notice them. When and where do rare birds show up? Obviously the migration season is a, is a popular time for that because birds are naturally on the move. Um, but birds also move in response to environmental stressors like uh, their climate, bad weather where they are supposed to be so they go somewhere else or too much food or too little food or uh, predators kind of hounding them where they are supposed to be so they move somewhere else. But generally birds show a pattern so this is an example of a pattern of rare birds that was discovered in the 60s and capitalized on in the 70s and 80s when North American birders started to realize that it was very common for Russian and European birds to uh, get lost over the North Pacific and end up on Attu Island and some of those other barrier islands off Alaska. So birders started going up there during spring migration and within 20 years, they added 30 new species to the ABA list. And other areas like possibly the most famous Cape May here is a peninsula that juts out into the ocean and uh, congregates rare birds. At the tip there, you can see at the bottom left corner is Cape May Point with nice marshlands and ponds and lakes and Lots of rare birds are turned up there. This is South Padre Island in Texas, the longest barrier island in the United States. And the southern tip of it has nice habitat and, and lots and lots of rare birds have ended up there just because it increases the detectability. It's a small area with not many trees and uh, it's surrounded by water. So birds are nat naturally drawn to it. In Florida, the uh, uh, Fort DeSoto is a popular location for rare birds. Another situation where you've got 
these small little barrier and mangrove islands, uh, making it easier to find rare things, and the entire Florida Keys chain of islands. But even here, this is a little screenshot of uh, very urban Miami, but there's these little pockets of green spaces, in particular A.D. Barnes Park there, right, right in the center, um, which just draw in rare birds that end up in this area because it's a nice big patch of habitat. And then up in the Cocoa Beach area or south of Merritt Island, uh, these little barrier island strips work to congregate birds. But sometimes rare birds just show up wherever they want to. This is a Couch's Kingbird I saw on a fire escape in um, the West Village of New York City one year. So which rare birds show up? Generally, there's a huge pattern of immature birds ending up where they shouldn't be because it's their first time migrating. And um, usually, if, if a mig even if an, a, a bird does migrate off path, it, it may not be successful in that and doesn't last through the winter or whatever, so it will not return or it will have realized its mistake and the next year it'll uh, try to go back to where it should be. Then we're getting into the meat of my presentation here, which is the mechanisms for why rare birds show up. So these are, are the reasons here. I'm gonna go into little case studies on each, starting with drift. And this is very common. Basically birds prefer to migrate under ideal conditions, which would be clear skies and a light tailwind. Uh, but when adverse conditions occur, birds can either stop or they get turned around if the wind shifts around. But each of these little adjustments takes energy. And ultimately, the bird may just give up and head for the nearest point of land heading downwind. And this is a common uh, way for swallowtail kites to be pushed and pulled off course. But a great example of this with true vagrants happens in the wintertime with northern lapwings. And actually, this happened to a lesser extent this winter. But basically unusually cold temperatures in Europe. Well, let me say that the Northern Lapwing is kind of like the European version of our killdeer. It's very similar size and habits. So in conditions where there's like a polar vortex type freeze in Europe and the ground freezes over, the Lapwings can't get at worms and things. So they'll move to more coastal locations where there's more food availability, but then what happened in 2012 is Superstorm Sandy came up into the North Atlantic during the peak migration of lapwings, co uh, combined with this event of freezing, which pushed the lapwings to the coast. And basically, you can see here, it sucked up lapwings. And there was this um, just strong push of west winds coming across the North Atlantic, combined with the uh, the uh, counterclockwise swirling of Hurricane Sandy. And that resulted in this incredible uh, uh, fallout of Northern Lappings along the East Coast. So look at these two diagrams from Ebert here on the left. Those are all sightings of Northern Lapwing from 1900 to 2011. And then in just the fall and winter of 2012 on the right, you can see uh, just the incredible scope of this event here, nearly doubling the number of records of lapwing we've ever detected in the East in one uh, three month period. And like I said, this did happen to a lesser extent back in November and December, and a bird was found in Nova Scotia, and then others were found in Connecticut, New York, uh, New Jersey, and Maryland. And in a similar and at the same time frame as that huge eruption of lapwings, this very rare whiskered turn was pushed over and discovered in Cape May. On a, from a Florida perspective, it's common for flamingos to be uh, to drift off course and end up in southern Florida. The next uh, reason for vagrancy is misorientation. 
And that's when migrants uh, have a faulty internal compass, essentially. And reverse migration is a very common example of this, where a bird simply migrates the wrong direction, but it does go the correct distance. Then there's overshooting, which is similar. That's when a bird migrating goes the correct direction, but goes too far. And an example of this lately, I'm not sure if they're still around, but uh, snow geese, they should be overwintering in the Delmarva and maybe as far south as the Carolinas. But sometimes if wind is in their favor or for whatever other reason, they'll overshoot those winter areas and end up in central northern Florida area. So a, an example that a species that sort of shows both misorientation and overshooting is the awesome fork-tailed flycatcher, really similar to a scissor tail, um, not as pinkish, and they actually have a longer tail. So they show misorientation in one way, which is where the savanna subspecies breeds in the Amazon and then migrates a long distance to southern South America. But occasionally during the same time frame, we'll find savanna subspecies forktail flycatchers in New England, which have migrated the correct distance, but they were misoriented by 180 degrees. Then there are the monarcha subspecies of forktail flycatcher which breeds in Colombia, Northern South America, and migrates a short distance to Central America, typically, but often they will overshoot that and you know double their migration instead of you know go the true distance and end up in Southern Texas and and sometimes Florida. Then there's dispersal. Many species engage in these regular dispersal events owls and rails and doves and uh, finches, like purple finches are famous for this. Often this is in response to a stressor or in the case of snowy owls, a boom in the population. One bird that's well known for this that Flor Floridians might not think about is the purple gallinal. And they're very well known long range vagrants. There's been records from Iceland and Western Africa and Europe and the Northeast. And this happens when individuals just spontaneously move a huge distance in response to climatic pressures. So check out this uh, heat map. Uh, in this winter, December of 2013, there was uh, severe drought conditions throughout South and Central Florida. And uh, perfectly in response to that, some purple gallinules started turning up in the Northeast. And very likely that was because there was no water in Florida. And so these young birds were like, what do we do? We need to go somewhere. And they took off and plopped down in the Northeast. At that same time, there was uh, uh, northerly winds uh, helping their trajectory to get out of Florida and move right up the East Coast. And it's always crazy thinking about rails because they, we always see them walking around, never really flying, but they are very capable flyers. And obviously they can pack on a lot of fat to help them travel long distance. So like I said, types, certain types of birds are especially prone to sporadic unpredicted dispersal. And this is possibly due to those species having less refined migratory instincts instead of evolving to migrate, breed one lo location and migrate to another. They uh, have these sort of sporadic uh, random pulses of movement. A great example of this was during the winter of 2012 and 2013, a ton of razorbills and other alcids made it this totally unprecedented move south. And this was due to a major increase in the sea surface temperature off the North Atlantic. And so the food they wanted wasn't there. And so thousands and thousands of birds moved south. This is a great picture that was taken in December of 2012 with a flock of razorbills flying off Miami Beach. And again, 
here's the eBird map for 1900 to 2011 on the left. It, you can see that the sightings, all time sightings kind of fizzle out by Northern Florida and there was only ever two records for Florida. But then that winter of 2012 and 2013, uh, huge numbers pushed south and they were found in almost every coastal county in Florida and even wrapping up around the Gulf into Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. So just really incredible eruption, but probably not too great for the birds. Uh, the food they wanted wasn't in the Northeast, but obviously the food they want isn't down south either. Otherwise they would do this every year. And so many of them were uh, uh, malnourished and not able to make the return flight. And it wasn't just razor bills, although they got the, uh, they were kind of the big celebrity of the thing because they're such a cool bird, but also all three scoter species and common myrrh and thick-billed myrrh and dove key shown here, uh, both red throat and common loon, they all push south in huge numbers as well. And like I said, uh, malnourished birds, may have died outright or like this white-winged scoter, they didn't have the proper uh, nutrients to do their winter molt. And so they were stuck in the South uh, to wait out a year as they got healthier. The next thing is association, which is when many birds, well, many birds have a strong instinct to be together in a flock. And so out of range birds are likely to join up with things that are similar to them, like this Franklin's gull there in the center is the Western equivalent of our laughing gulls. And so it's very common to uh, find an out of range Franklin's gull mixed with laughing gulls. Basically the laughing gulls are little decoys to lure in this rare bird. And to a rare extent, this gull here on the bottom is a Vega gull from Siberia, and they are very similar, possibly the same species as our herring gull. And so when they're found in Florida, they're with herring gulls. And then this Hearman's gull, which is sort of a, a famous over the last few years, has been roaming up and down the Florida and Eastern coast uh, with other gulls. It should be on the West coast and down into Mexico, but somehow got off course and now it's just moving around with our goals and will probably spend its whole life on the East Coast. Here's that same bird after it molted into its adult plumage. It came up to Cape May and was the first record for Cape May. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, white-faced ibis, which when they come to Florida, they have pink faces. So it's kind of a uh, the, a bad name for when they show up in Florida, but white-faced ibis, they associate and flock up with glossy ibis. And if you look very closely in the center of this photo, there's the tiny little neotropic cormorant there, which is often found out of range with the uh, common and regular double-crested cormorant. And these two brant were a great example of association where um, a single brant was found at Lake Apopka, uh, right there above Orlando, and presumably the same bird went up to Daytona Beach. Then it went down to the Everglades, where it was suddenly joined by a second brant, and then they moved up to Port St. Lucie, then they went over to the Fort Myers area, then they went back to the Daytona Merritt Island area, um, and clearly both of the birds were misoriented and lost, and confused by the shape of Florida, but um, after the fact here, it's really neat to look at this map of its movements because you can see that every time it, it went somewhere, it attempted to take this same trajectory to the Northeast, but uh, ran into the ocean and had to try something else. Then there's dis disorientation, um, which is pretty rare rare situation is more of a short-term problem where a weather event gets a bird off course and then a, uh, the bird may be swept up in some other thing, but uh, truly disorientated birds are probably pretty rare or, or die before they can do anything drastic. 
Then there's human activities, which are, are just daily things that change and manipulate the environment. And so we've had the direct impact on the displacement of many birds, either through trading species in the pet trade and sending them where they shouldn't be, or accidentally shipping birds across the world, or the purposeful introduction of exotic species. Uh, monk parakeet is a popular bird in the pet trade, or at least it was, and they've gotten loose and then set up colonies throughout the southeast and Texas and even up in New York and Chicago and Connecticut. And of course, European starling. Um, then there's sort of a mysterious case that happened in the Miami area where this pair of great black hawks, which should be in uh, northern South America, they were seen for decades on the Crandon Beach area, Key Biscayne. And generally, the consensus is that these were being kept in a private collection and somehow escaped and uh, set up shop there in Miami. Here's a great example of sort of a natural vagrancy that was helped along by human activities. Basically, uh, a birder, Peter Leahy, documented six of these brambling, which are a European finch. They jumped on a container ship, uh, leaving Russia there. Uh, on September 24th, six were on board, and Peter documented uh, them every day as they moved across. And you can see there were six, six continued about two weeks later, then there was down to two, then eventually down to one, and that one bird rode the ship all the way into Los Angeles and then flew away. So uh, it did get on board the ship. They did get on board the ship to their own devices, uh, but they rode the ship for safety all the way across the Pacific Ocean. And uh, these uh, hooded crows here, a good example of that. They are famous for uh, riding ships all around the world and have been introduced uh, at many locations around the world. Uh, after, near ports and things like that. And so there's this little family group of them down in uh, the St. Pete area and their numbers have kind of declined and they've started hybridizing with fish crows. Then there's false vagrancy, which is a case like is common with seabirds where we thought things like this white-faced storm petrel and herald petrel were rare birds, but that was purely our own ignorance or inability to get out on the ocean enough. And now that we've uh, figured out that, you know, the third week of August or second week of September is prime time to find these, they're found every year off the East Coast. And range expansions, pretty straightforward. Simply birds expand their range. It's always happened and now it's happening on a more rapid basis. Uh, here are some classic range expanders you're all familiar with in Florida, but uh, now things like cardinal and red-bellied woodpecker are residents up into Canada where they were unheard of 20 years ago. Cormorant and mockingbird also making a massive range expansion and population boom. Some more recent examples are sandhill cranes, which have capitalized on the uh, same population booms in snow geese and Canada geese. Uh, common raven has declined significantly in the east due to human uh, clearing of land, but has now adapted to urban environments and is, is uh, booming again. And white pelican has massive population increase and huge, huge numbers over winter in Florida now. And the rufous hummingbird, due to more exotic plantings on the East Coast and people keeping hummingbird feeders up, they've been detected and maybe they were always there, but more commonly detected now, uh, wintering on the East Coast. And they're very hardy too. Uh, Rufus hummingbirds in Pennsylvania were able to withstand negative 20 degrees for multiple days. And white ibis is making a huge population boom and range expansion now breeding up into 
New Jersey as of last year. Similarly, this bird that looks very much like a northern mockingbird, but is actually a tropical mockingbird. You can see here, it doesn't have the big white patch in the wings. Uh, they're making a huge range expansion in South America. And so it would make sense for some of those pioneering birds to jump over into Florida, which this one did. It was found in Palm Beach County, but unfortunately ignored by the records committee as unknown provenance, but there's a pretty good explanation for why it would turn up out of place. One thing holding it back, I guess, is that they're good singers and so maybe more likely to have been a escaped uh, black market pet trade scenario. And a good example of this is with northern or crested caracaras in the north. Basically over the past 10 years, there's been this huge rush of entirely adult crested caracaras turning up far from where they should be. Um, it's a mystery if they're from Texas or Florida, um, but there are population declines in both Texas and Florida. And so it's possible that it's these adult birds um, losing where they've been breeding and setting out, searching for new areas to set up shop. And then a just an incredible uh, textbook example of a bird taking over and expanding its range is the Eurasian collar dove. And no species has colonized North America so rapidly. Here's a great map that was put into the new uh, version of the Nat Geo Guide to Birds in North America that just came out. And you can see the introduction of Eurasian collar dove there in the Bahamas in 1975. And then it only took a few decades before they were found across the entire United States and down in through Mexico. But notably, they've never been able to take over the Northeast. And that's uh, one of the biggest mysteries in, in birding. And finally, some rare birds just make no sense at all. Uh, this one in particular is a hybrid of a tropical kingbird and a scissor tail flycatcher, which is just an insane hybrid. And then it was found in coastal New Hampshire, which doesn't make any sense either because neither of those birds should be here. And, and, and just the odds of this are so low and it's so strange, but uh, it does follow the pattern of rare birds being more commonly detected along the coastline just because it bunches things up. But doesn't make much sense. So who knows where it, it uh, came from and, and what its deal is. But ultimately, get out there, explore new places, keep an open mind, and, and try to document some of this and maybe use some of this to help you find your own rare birds. And that's about it. Thank you very much. All right, we did have a few questions. Great, thank um, you, Alex. <clears throat> yeah, that was great. We did have um, a question from James Hill was wanted to know, are there still tours to Atu in the Aleutians? He had heard that the FAA had shut down flights there. Yeah, that's true. It's very hard or impossible to get to Atu anymore. And so people now go, to St. Paul Island and some of the Privilof Islands, which are north of Attu, but um, have better accommodations and uh, have proven to have the rare birds as well. And Cindy Manel wanted to know, um, when you were showing the gulls that were going back and forth, um, are the gulls banded so that they can be tracked? The gulls. Oh, well, not, not necessarily. I forget which instance you're talking about, but um, some rare birds have been captured and tagged. And uh, for instance, on my very first slide of that uh, whole presentation, I had a picture of a yellow green vireo and that um, we live in Cape May in the fall and yellow green vireo is supposed to be in Central America, but two years in a row, yellow green vireo turned up in Cape May and one year, uh, both of the times it was captured at the banding station and banded. And so 
the one year a little uh, satellite or radio and cellular tracker was put on the bird and we were able to track it all around Cape May and see what it was doing and what it was feeding on and ultimately it headed back south where it was supposed to. Uh, but there's no real dedicated research towards rare birds like this, uh, just because it's a lot of money to invest in one bird. But uh, patterns, patterns start to emerge that, that teach us a lot, like um, white-faced ibis turning up every year in the east and ash-throated flycatcher and things like that. Sure. Now, and, Jeannie wants to know, what is the best time of year to go to Cape May? The best time of the year is September and October. From mid-September to mid-October is the best time. And yes, I did mean house crows, but I was could not think of that at the time. But thank you, oh. Landerville, yes. All right. Um, and Deborah Green had mentioned that many of us are seeing painted buntings at our feeder when we put up millet. I'm going to say I have quite a few this year, so it's really nice. And Christiana had mentioned, it said, you mentioned disoriented birds are not typical, but sometimes during weather events. Have there been more observations of disoriented birds during an El Nino or La Nina years? Um, I can't think of any examples but um, when similar like uh, things like that happen on the west coast it, especially pelagic birds will end up misplaced or in higher than average numbers but yeah any any major weather event like that is bound to push things off course and then a lot of comments excellent presentation um, Deborah wanted to know if you'd heard about painted buntings, if they are increasing. Um, Especially our, I think our population is separate from Texas. I think that's what I remember reading about. In ours yeah, well, small. they definitely can capitalize on weedy, uh, grassy, brushy areas. So neighborhoods are really great for that. And, and bird feeders help too. They you know, you're saying putting out millet draws them in and millet's great and cheap bird seeds. So I'm mm -hmm. sure they're doing okay, but they've, they've all been hidden from eBird because of the risk of being trapped and shared around in the pet trade. And so it's hard to really uh, keep tabs on them myself, but maybe you all have noticed it uptick in your yards. Um, Susan Young mentioned um, that there is a small flock of tricolored munia at Palm Beach right now at Torrey Island. Do you think they are escapees or vagrants? I think there was up to six of them sighted, as I recall. That's a crazy situation. I've been kind of keeping tabs on that. Well, tricolored munia was always ignored in Florida as an escapee, but they are established and booming on, on Cuba. And so most of the tricolor munia sightings in, in Florida have always been at dry tortugas or in the Keys where it makes a ton of sense where one would jump off Cuba and end up there. And so Palm Beach is not far away. Uh, the strange part of it to me is that there's a group of six. So I don't know if two came over and they somehow found each other and started breeding there, but I don't know about that one. The fact that there's six makes it a little suspicious, but Palm Beach is notorious for Cuban and Bahama, Bahamian stray birds. So it could go either way. I don't know. Um, Bill Lunch um, is asking when species get off track, like the wrong directions, do they get back home? That's another toss up one, but I think uh, oftentimes it does work out to the benefit of the bird. And if they survive the winter and have the resources they need, they uh, will come year after year. Again, the ash sort of flycatcher there at uh, the Lust Road entrance came back for like five years in a row or something crazy. So it shouldn't be there, but it did fine and it, it returned annually. Yeah, and Landrova wanted to know, do oil spills affect rare birds? Well, maybe not rare birds, but it does push birds away from where 
Uh, they should be, for instance, on the West Coast, tons of oil rigs offshore, and it's had a, a real bad influence on Western grebes trying to winter on the ocean because the grebes show up in the winter and there's oil everywhere. So they get pushed off track and may try to spend the winter on freshwater lakes, which doesn't have the resources for them. So I don't know about rare birds, but it certainly has an effect on pushing birds around. And then obviously the direct effect of birds getting covered in oil is not good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Christiana said, great presentation. Jen Edison is pointing out that she has all male painted buntings, but no female. So that's interesting. I kind of have a mixed group. And Mark Heinen is saying he's going to miss you at the bog and he'll be there next week. And that Ken Kaufman is birding in Columbia. Oh, <laughs> so. oh well, I'm going to my bog tours at the end of February. So yeah, but I'm looking forward to it. Seems like not the best owl year, but hopefully we turn some things up. And yeah, I might be going to Columbia soon too. So maybe I'll check in with Ken about that. Nice. Excellent. And then a lot of comments of great presentation. And thank you for sharing your expertise. Yeah, thanks everybody. Program. Thank you.